in the name of the CEOs of Economics Online Seminar. We continue this week with a uh, mini symposium on the topic of culture festivals in an era of COVID-19, new research agendas and data sources. The uh, seminar will be chaired by Professor Jens Noble of Rhodes University, also member of the program committee of CEOs. And the panelists today are Professor Ian Woodward, University of Southern Denmark, Dr. Roberta Communion of King's College London, and Mr. Delan Tarantal of Rhodes University, South Africa. I give the word now to Jen. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andre, and also for, for creating this, um, this space for a little mini symposium. Um, thank you very much, everybody who's um, come, and we hope it's going to be a sort of an interesting um, afternoon session. Um, the way that we're going to structure it is that first we're going to hear from our three um, speakers. We're going to talk for sort of 10 to 15 minutes each. Um, if you think of uh, comments or um, questions that you'd like to ask as they're going um, along, please feel free to put them in the chat. And then at the end of the seminar, when all three people have spoken, then we'll um, have time for discussion and um, to answer some of the questions. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three speakers to you. Um, firstly, Professor Ian Woodward, who you can see on the screen there waving now. Okay, um, Professor Woodward is in the Department of Business and Management at the University of Southern Denmark. He previously worked at Griffith University in Australia. He publishes in the areas of cosmopolitanism studies, uh, sociologies of consumption and material culture, and the cultural economy of music. In this field, he recently published the books Vinyl, uh, and labels with Bloomsbury Anthropology. Um, his recent work, and the reason that we've invited him today, is that he's also part of a large EU-funded project on European music festivals, where the main challenge is to understand the um, coordination and representation and negotiation of cultural diversities in the context of music festivals. Our second speaker is going to be Dr. Roberta Comunian, smiling and waving now, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, she's a reader in creative economy in the Department for Culture, Media and the Creative Industries at King's College in London. Her research interests include creative industries, creative graduates, creative cities and urban studies. Um, she's also recently researched the role of higher education in the creative economy and has published a fantastic book called Developing Creative Economies in Africa. Um, she publishes articles in a wide range of journals, including the International Journal of Cultural and Creative Industries, Cultural Trends and Regional Studies. And we've asked her to come and um, talk to us today because of her involvement in an um, AHRC funded project um, called Future Festivals South Africa. And then finally, we have Mr. Dylan Tarantal with the exciting background, waving now. Um, Dylan is a lecturer in the Department of Economics and Economic History at Rhodes University. He specializes in quantitative econometric research methods, big data, and mathematical economics. Um, I encouraged him to, to do uh, to the dark side of doing cultural economics research some years ago. And we've worked together on things like um, online gaming, production, markets, and consumption patterns, and innovation and business models in the cultural and creative industries. Um, he also works in the financial markets. Um, Dylan is also part of the Future Festival South Africa team, um, and we look forward to hearing all the exciting things you can do with Google Analytics. So those are our, our exciting uh, panel for today. Um, over to you, Professor Woodward, if you'd like to share your screen, go ahead now. Okay, good. Yes, we can see. Okay, good. Okay, yeah, thank you, Jen, very much, and um, yeah, nice 
nice that everyone could be here and I'm looking forward to, to hearing also about uh, the other projects. But as Jen said, uh, I uh, lead and am a PI on this uh, project um, here. Um, Humanities in the Re European Research Area, or HERA, and it comes out of an H2020 program called um, the Joint Research Project on Public Spaces in Europe. And our, our project title is European Music Festival's Public Spaces, because the call for the Horizon 2020 program was about public spaces and cultural diversity. Um, and you can see from the list of people there, there's around five PIs and then around another five um, funded PhDs or, or postdocs. And you can see at the bottom there that um, there's a number of participating institutions. My university, Sudansk, coordinates uh, Erasmus in Rotterdam, Limerick in Ireland, Bristol, and then uh, Jagiellonian in Krakow. These are the partners on the project. Um, so, uh, whoops. Uh, let me uh, let me first take you to some um, to some uh, discussion of the framing of the project. So I guess today I give a quick sort of overview about um, about what the project is and give you a sense of where we're going or where we've gone with the data collection and give you some insights into into what we've been doing in the project. Um, the foundational literatures for the project, um, these are the literatures that I guess helped us get the grant um, and helped us to frame the project. Um, firstly, we, we talked about, um, or, or we framed the project in terms of festivalization processes. Um, festivals here become a medium and a, and a sort of a key site for producing and consuming culture for packaging it. But more importantly, perhaps in terms of the politics of festivals, festivals also become a way of establishing, mediating, representing public culture more broadly and also become potential spaces of belonging. So the festivalization thesis um, was was one key uh, mode of framing uh, the literature, but this also links to discussions about the cultural public sphere and discussions around the role of culture as a potential way um, of um, of uh, mediating social inclusion. Beyond this, um, we framed the project in terms of um, encounter spaces, and I guess this this is where my expertise in cosmopolitanism studies, but also other PIs expertise around migration, around ethnicities also came into the mix in terms of our, in terms of our um, expertise, is that we, we framed the festival uh, as a space of encounter, uh, where people were potentially exposed to um, cultures, persons, bodies, styles, musics that were different. And so the, the fundamental question is, what is the power of the music festival in terms of creating spaces of social inclusion and belonging? Um, uh, also beyond this, there's significant expertise in the, in the team in terms of music studies. So all, in some way or another, all of us have some background or expertise in music studies. And here we frame the project in terms of thinking about um, in, uh, the special capacity of music as a form of aesthetic expression beyond spoken language and as something that um, most people have an interest and a capacity to engage with so partly the project is framed around the special potential of music I guess you could also frame it in terms of potential of another mode of consumption uh, another field of consumption like food but but our specialty in the project was music festivals uh, and also each of us have this background in sort of cultural consumption broadly in sociologies of cultural consumption so we were interested in, in asking about the longer term effects of participation in festivals um, in terms of uh, mediating belongings and in terms of, um, in terms of um, people's perceptions around um, the local and the global and how the festival space becomes, um, becomes a zone where these, these sorts of questions are mediated. Uh, now, but this, this, this of course all changed because we got the funding for this a year and a half ago or nearly two years ago, I guess. Uh, but of course, six or eight months after we got the funding, um, the uh, COVID crisis um, emerged. And in fact, we couldn't, um, we couldn't undertake the field work as promised. The project still continues, but in order, to, in order for us to, to have relevance, the frameworks of the, um, of the study changed substantially. So at a, on a concrete level, we're now looking at things like industry and worker stress, people, uh, people, um, workers in the festival industry, organizers, technicians, and so on. We're looking at um, questions of loss, of stress, and of precarity amongst the workforce. 
we're looking at this, uh, the loss of festivals post COVID in terms of what might be called cultural trauma uh, as the loss of spaces of social ritual. And we ask how and why this matters. Um, and, but we also um, now significantly look at the, the response to COVID and the ways in which this loss of the festival ritual has been mobilized um, against and the ways in which people have a, a certain type of creative response uh, to this context, not just people, rather organizations. And so in this, in this way, a substantial part of our study in the last year has been looking at how festivals undergo processes of repair, how they, are, how they, how they recover. But this is also, um, but this is also substantially partly about remembering and also remaking festivals in different ways. So, so the, sub, the sub, substantive frameworks of the study, which were idealized around standard literatures in cultural consumption, in, in literatures on social encounters, literatures on cosmopolitanism, music, have been somewhat put aside, and we need to ask these new questions given the current situation. The data and methods, um, I mean. We originally proposed to do a standard suite of snapshot methods. We have 15 music festival partners, three in each country. And beyond that, we also have partnerships with people, peak organizations in each of our countries. But we propose with their cooperation to do standard uh, audience surveys, audience participant observation, audience interviews, media analysis, audiovisual diaries. But of course, the new context, Corona, um, means that, um, which is radically uncertain and unfolding, uh, and has been for a year, a year and a half or so for these festivals, demanded a more ethnographic following of emergent contexts, actors and spaces. So we had to radically rethink our, our approach to collecting the data and make, making the project viable. What we do now is, or for the last year or so, is a series of longitudinal interviews with staff in key organiser roles. So we look at the ways in which organisers and um, organisations respond to Corona and we map um, using the using our 15 cases or maybe maybe not the entire group but some cases um, the ways in which the organizations respond and deal with this crisis we then do longitudinal interview and participant observations with festival audiences net the graphic study of festival social media practices because of course um, the space of lack of physical festivals has been somewhat filled by um, by digitalization and in this sense, we do PO and ethnographic studies of festival digital spaces and the emergence of hybrid events. And we also basically do an ethnographic following of festival strategy and mobilization through 20 and 21. Let me just give you a sense of some of the data and some of the interesting findings uh, that come up um, and, and which, which might be um, interesting and relevant to think about, but also give you a sense of how, um, how the festivals that we've been following have um, adapted and responded to the corona crisis and most of the all of these examples I think are Danish example exception of one are Danish examples because it's just easy for me to talk about but but um, but it's uh, similar patterns across all of our European festivals first of all what we, what we did in our audiences study was to follow people ethnographically and to look at the ways in which they um, materially remade festivals and festival atmospheres at home in their backyard uh, in in yeah, mostly in their backyard and the ways in which um, the boundary of the festival was extended into the domestic space in 2020 so that when festivals were cancelled people held their own festivals at home uh, we saw this as a type of repair of, um, of of the loss of the festival ritual and rebuilding of uh, of the festival community and and festival friends but also festival partners including sponsors so this is a photo um, of of uh, a small group of friends who back in June 2020 held a party in their nice uh, backyard uh, to honor the festival that they loved, Heartland Festival in Denmark. And uh, you can see they've got chandeliers, mirror balls, fires, and reclining lounges. So the sort of attempt to recreate the festival atmosphere at home. And you can see this nice quote, hell yes, we're just gonna make a Heartland at home. Another example here, Heartland in this town called Moorsland, which is nowhere near the festival site, but, um, but it shows the power of a festival to draw people across country. And again, people remade the festival, recreated all of the, all of the material genres of the festival uh, in their backyard. And you can see the weather suited, suited them, but they were, um, they were um, holding these events on the day in which the festival would have been with a small number of friends and often go to the extent of having bars set up and live music and all the 
to even tick, even fake tickets and so on. And they, they went to a lot of effort to recreate the festival atmosphere. And the person here says, but yeah, I think it just wasn't an ordinary backyard party. There was real, really some festival atmosphere about it. So this was an attempt by audiences to deal with the loss of the festival. Um, and, and, and some people went about recreating um, their favorite festivals in their backyards. Uh, and, and in Denmark at this time, of course, um, you know, um, uh, gathering numbers were very small. So, um, so yeah, um, this is this is another example of a street festival in Copenhagen in the district of Norbro, which is um, which has uh, recently been nominated or voted by Time Out as the coolest uh, neighborhood in the world. But Norbro, for the last twenty five years or so, has held this big street festival called. Um, Distortion, and Distortion is famous for being a riotous, wi riotous, wild event with crazy techno music and just, uh, just a very, very much a youth-oriented event, of, uh, a free event. But this, uh, this year, what they did was, or last year, what they did was to reanimate the zones of the festival in the city with, in various types of ironic, clever, creative ways. And so um, this was, uh, this was about. Um, about managing the corona numbers, but also giving something back to the festival community and the festival district. This is ironic because the last thing that this festival would have had would have been a choir as a banging techno, but but the festival wanted to wanted to remember the event on the streets of uh, of the district in which the festival would have usually been held. So they drove around in their old truck with a, with a beautiful choir and gave away free beer and so on and so forth. So this was, this was a way of remembering and emplacing the festival, um, but in a different way. Uh, likewise, there are a whole range of very clever ways in which um, organizers in Copenhagen got around the corona, um, the corona regulations. Here you can see the uh, well-known Danish and maybe international band called Who Made Who playing on Copenhagen Harbor. And the clever thing was that each raft and each boat that was around the, the harbour had a maximum of 10 people. And this in no way broke. Okay, so uh, this was a clever way of getting around the corona regulations, but also creating a certain type of atmosphere, albeit on the harbour of Copenhagen, but the main harbour nonetheless, and, and a way of um, creating a sense of public excitement um, and, a, and a way of also remembering the festival. This was an unannounced event. They couldn't announce it. The police said that they couldn't announce it, but this was an event mostly for, for supporters, for sponsors, for volunteers, but it spread out into the public. Uh, Next slide. Uh, similarly, this was supported in the public culture more broadly, and this points to the importance of festivals in the Danish summer. The, the, the main TV station here in Denmark, DR, held a series of seven nationally televised news, music events through the summer of 2020, where they celebrated, mythologized, narrated each, each event, and talked about the relevance of each of these different music festivals for Danish communities. Uh, these were anything from uh, rock festivals to techno festivals to uh, blues and to jazz and so on. Uh, and we got to attend those events. These were, um, as I say, televised um, ways of uh, remember, there's some more music, but I'll skip that. We also, in the last uh, year, have, um, of course, focused on the development of online and hybrid experiences. This is from a PhD in Poland who has been following the Poland rock festival and she has eth uh, participated ethnographically um, um, at the at this event and and followed its um, its movement from physical to digital and back to hybrid and this is her on the left uh, various ways of giving us a festival atmosphere and on the right showing the distribution of participants at the Poland rock online event um, around the world so not just in uh, not just in Poland so what's happening here what from an original study of cultural consumption, encounter space, and the power of music and community, we've had to shift radically. And in the last year, then we've focused on processes around remembering. Um, uh, we've focused on uh, uh, 
on process uh, on processes of preserving and protecting the festival and we're focused on processes of, of remaking festivals so remembering festivals is audiences and organizers obviously but also the media more broadly and and making sure also in this sense that um, the interests of sponsors are protected um, when the festival is remembered um, this is also a, a way of preserving and protecting audiences because Danish festivals are very worried that not having had festivals for a couple of years, people might forget about festivals or might decide that going to the beach over summer or somewhere else over summer is a better idea. And I've actually, people might discover that they don't miss volunteering at these festivals, that, that they can do other things. So it's been important for festivals to preserve and protect their memory or their public memory. Uh, and this has been a substantial part of what they have done in the last year. A lot of the things they've done, of course, have not made money, but they have been an important investment in the futuring of the festival. Um, in some ways, however, they've been forced to remake um, and to, to, to make again, not just digitally, but to offer, offer different, um, different futures for their festivals. And in Denmark, there's been a, a series of festivals, um, new festivals that have popped up in response to the COVID crisis. Uh, uh, caveats and context just to finish i'm not sure how i'm going for time I, I feel like i've rushed through it but at least i'm within time um caveats and context there's a danish context i think we need to think about different european contexts and the meaning of these events in national uh in the national consciousness so in denmark the, the summer festival has this sort of iconic quality uh we have roskilde of course uh, one of the biggest music festivals but this also generates a whole um, a whole investment in the music festival as a key component of summer experience in terms of people's personal economy saving up and going, but also in terms of uh, of, um, of of a ritual um, um, with for young people in particular. This is also linked to um, different different forms of government assistance. This has been one thing that we have followed as well: the ways in which different types of government assistance has um, has allowed different types of responses. Um, particularity of festivals here is important um, as um, as as is the context of um, taste communities and cultural style I think I might finish but but of course I can address any of these things um, with with um, discussion is okay within time great great yes yes thank you so much um that was uh, uh, really a glimpse of of what looks like a fantastic um, rich uh, research project I particularly like netnographic research which yes. I hadn't actually yes. um, come across before um, so okay. lots of ideas and interesting things there um, I think what Good. we'll do is is um, let's move on to our, our next speaker um, so um, Dylan I mean sorry Roberta if you if you're ready to um, to share your slides that would be great and then um, just for the audience if you're having ideas um, you have questions things you want to return to um, please feel free to to put them into the chat as we go along and then we'll have discussion at the end so over to you Roberta uh, is asking me to stop somebody else sharing so yeah no it's okay yes that's great we can see your slides now Perfect. Okay, let me start then. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining the seminar. It's really great to start talking about festival in relationship to COVID-19 and their impact and also to have, you know, different projects addressing similar questions. So um, I'm going to talk about our project Future Festival South Africa. Uh, Jen is involved in the project and hopefully this project also functions as a good introduction to Dylan presentation. It will go into more details in some of the data analysis he has been doing. Doing. So Future Festival South Africa um, is a project that we just, uh, um, we have been awarded from the HRC and we worked on it in the past 12 months, so it's, uh, it's a year now. Uh, since we started the project. And in this little presentation, I wanted to give you an introduction to the project, talk a little bit about the research team, specifically in the way we approach the subject, very multidisciplinary, in a way that is multidisciplinary to really try and answer common questions, but from very different perspective. I'll give you an overview of the methodology we have adopted. And obviously, since we just 
completing the data collection. I can give you some early insights from the data, but this is still currently being analyzed. So obviously uh, it would be great to have your feedback, but also just uh, please treat the data still as ongoing in, in the process of being analyzed. And we will also offer some ideas around futuring of festivals, so what will happen in the future. So the research project, as I said, is uh, just closing now, uh, although we have a little extension to do some more analysis. It was funded by the AHRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council here in the UK, as actually an urgency call, an emergency call because of the impact of COVID. And he really wanted to uh, think about the impact of COVID on arts festivals in South Africa. We have obviously uh, the really important uh, uh, background and understanding from Jen and the South African team about the, the role the festival in South Africa have been playing um, uh, within, within the economy, within the local cultural development. So considering how COVID-19 would have specifically impacted that sector was very important for us. And we wanted to also build the knowledge base or what was happening, but also think about collaborative network or knowledge sharing that could happen amongst the festival to allow them to learn from each other's new practices and responses. So as I said, we adopted a mixed method at the collection and that included um, mapping. Um, I will show you in a minute some lovely map created by one of the postdoc working with us, Fiona Drummond. And, uh, um, we use case studies, quantitative audience data, mapping, qualitative interviews, and futuring activities. So as you can see, a very mixed uh, uh, method approach, but all kind of addressing the same question around the impact of COVID. And obviously, we are really interested overall in thinking about what kind of adaption has been happening to festival, the new business model and new approaches that have been uh, taking place in the past 12 months and how festival have reacted. And here you've got the link, I will put it in the chat once we finish the presentation to the project that we've got a blog with some interesting reading there if you want to see what's been happening with the project. So as I say, a very multidisciplinary team is obviously that's me. I come from the context of creative and cultural economies. Uh, my colleague, Jonathan Gross from a similar background, but obviously we got some great economists involved. So Jen and Dylan specifically working with data and Fiona has been uh, specializing in GIS and has given us great uh, mapping tools so to analyze the impact of COVID on festivals. And overall, if I look at the overall research design, this is um, started with very much with the data collection and mapping of what's been happening in the past year. So looking at data pre previous um, data from pre-COVID and what kind of festivals there were in South Africa, how they took place, where they took place, and then considering what happened in the last year in 2019 and 2020, Afterwards, so during the lockdown, and obviously we're waiting to collect some more data to conclude also the 2021 year and see overall the uh, during COVID and post COVID. Although in South Africa, obviously the wave of COVID have been slightly different from maybe from European ones or others, but really still looking about the development and how things have been happening in those gaps where COVID allowed festivals to think about their activities. Uh, beyond that, we also uh, decided that after that, we would choose some case studies and we got seven festivals, which we have analyzed in different ways with different methods. And uh, most of them, the, uh, some of the festival, for some of the festival, we got all of these methods. So we have both quantitative data, qualitative interviews and futuring. For some, we have just a few of them. So we have had again to choose a little bit how to uh, direct the resources, but overall we have a really comprehensive picture of different ways in which this festival have adapted. And the way we have uh, treated this data is also to be able to, while we develop the analysis, feedback information to the festival, get their feedback, and also organize, we organized a, a networking event where we could share some preliminary funding with other festivals. So again, trying to build also a reflective knowledge sharing practice with the festival so that our knowledge, whatever we were learning, was also becoming beneficial for the sector not simply staying you know within our books uh, or papers and obviously the overall outcome of the project are some academic publication but also a final report which again will try to collect very much this practice knowledge and this policy implication of what has been happening to festival during COVID and post-COVID and again very much hoping to benefit the sector uh, nationally in terms of South Africa but we think there's quite a lot of learning that could be relevant internationally of course. 
So in terms of the data mapping, this is the work of Fiona, but I'm uh, reporting to you uh, what we've been doing. So um, we done online searches and web scraping, and through that we could uh, find a list of festivals that obviously took place in South Africa in 2019 and 2020. As you can see, they are here divided by region, and as you can see, the impact of COVID in that uh, shift between 2019 and 2020, 2020 is obviously quite impressive. Um, in terms of the reduction of, of overall events. Uh, if we look into more details on the kind of organization uh, on the festivals that we were talking about, as you can see, uh, the art sector being one that is particularly affected by this reduction, the music one as well. Well, for instance, film or literary event or comedy event, as you can see, have responded a little bit better. We're able to maybe go ahead online or in other formats. So we see the arts and culture and music where uh, maybe the events that were a little bit more affected. Um, the map that Fiona produced, and uh, again, I can put the link on the blog if you want to have a bit more time to look at them and read the details, tells us obviously of this shift and how uh, the re overall reduction of number of festivals has taken place across the two years. Uh, but the most interesting one is actually looking at the responses, as, a, as you can see here, a lot of festival uh, basic uh, could happen if they were before the lockdown, so early uh, 2020, but mostly, you know, were cancelled. So you can see those big red uh, segments that highlight the cancellation of festival. We have a tiny slices of green, which were hybrid, hybrid event where some face-to-face -face and some online went on. And then obviously the big purple, a lot more moving into the virtual space. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, obviously showing a very challenging picture of what has happened in this year. And we look forward to have the 2021 data because again, we can see what kind of shift has been happening and what kind of learning as well has taken place. And we assume that maybe less cancellation and maybe more adaption would happen in a slightly longer term picture. Here I'm focusing on the qualitative work, so the case studies. Uh, we selected uh, seven case studies, as I said, as you can see from this table, very different events, both in terms of their original cover, type of events, and very different ways in which they've responded. So as you can see, there are, in some of our case studies, we had online and hybrid sort of combination. For some others, we had complete new innovation, like a festival turning into a drive-in festival for obviously compliance with COVID, other uh, going only online, another festival actually transferring only on WhatsApp. So you can see very different responses, uh, one uh, turning into a television, uh, broadcasting as a solution. So you can see uh, a need obviously to map this festival and their adoption and understand how those decision processes were coming about. And that was very much part of our discussion and what they brought about within the organization. And here I'm just kind of discussing briefly some emerging themes into our data analysis. And I think these are perhaps the most interesting, but there is a lot of other obviously details that could be uh, addressed in terms of how this festival adapted and took decisions in relation to evolving uh, with COVID. So uh, one of the, the things that we found was really interesting is how for many the, the COVID-19 obviously came as, as you just said, Ian, as a very traumatic event, but on the other side, as a way to re-evaluating core values and purpose of festival. So actually as a way to think about what is it that we're trying to achieve with this festival that can't be transferred face to face or can't be done in any other way. And I saw a lot of organizations actually going back to themselves, thinking about what is our objective and thinking about if that is our objective, then the festival is only a mean. We can still do other things that achieve those objectives and remain true to our goals. So this um, going back to the core of the objective of festival, I think is a very important moment of reassessment, of reorganization after the trauma, as Ian called it, of COVID. And uh, it's actually one that is very powerful for organization to then try and rethink about what they're doing and what should be planned for the future. And uh, the one dynamic that emerged from this organization is that we saw a lot of innovation and risk taking taking place. So on one side, organizations saying that actually um, what it is important is they remain true to some of those objectives, to some of the things they were delivering, the kind of people they wanted to engage, 
but actually there were a lot of ways in which they could go about doing it in different ways and testing. In many ways, for some of these organizations, the challenge was not uh, the testing or the being innovative, it's actually working out a business model that could go with that. So actually we can say that in that respect, the festival have been really groundbreaking and really uh, taking uh, a leap of faith in a lot of those activities that have never happened before online or in other platform. And really the, the slower uh, sort of side of the organization has been this mis business model adoption. And, uh, but as you can see, um, another um, organization say, we dream a lot, but we only move on things when we are pushed. So again, the idea that quite a lot of them had the plan in the future to do more on digital, to do more kind of engagement online and things like that. They never went around doing it, but COVID kind of pushed them to say, actually, this is the moment to try out what we couldn't, uh, what we haven't been thinking about trying before. So yeah, a moment of break, but also a moment to rethink and redo things. And um, uh, one emergent, um, emergent idea is also how the festival themselves turned into a different organization during uh, COVID. Before, they were very much the kind of programming organizations where they, you had a lot of artists, you did the programming, and you delivered whatever was the content of the festival planned. Here we see that, first of all, the festival becomes almost like a, a port of call for artists and creatives. So, so artists and creatives that can go online themselves, artists and creatives which from one day to another lost their jobs, their income, and everything because of COVID, look at festival as networks, as organization that could help and with which they could co-work something. On the other side, obviously, festival not having themselves the final answer on what a festival would look like in COVID, looked at the artists, helps people they could work with to test the idea, to try and work out something else for themselves and for the artists. So we see very much this collaboration partnership between artists and festivals, but also between funders and festival, for instance. So funders, again, very used to see their logos on big banners, kind of thinking, okay, we can't have the logos on big banners, there's no event anymore, but can, we can still support the festival. And what would we do? How would we work out this collaboration if banners and logos cannot happen as they were coming uh, happening before in face-to-face -face events? So again, we see a lot of this co-creation, these people coming together and working out a pathway rather than necessarily uh, somebody you know, driving this. But it's quite interesting that this network nature and this collaboration then turns a bit the role of festival overall as not just being the programming aspect, but much, much more these co-producers of ideas and platform and ways of working. And the last aspect of the festival, which we're still uh, finalizing, the some data collection is still going on, is the futuring aspect of festival. So as part of the project, we actually asked some artists, but as well as some producers and some audience to answer a question around what is a festival in 2020. 30. So write a letter to yourself in the future and tell us what you see in your festival in 2030. What's happening there? Who's involved? Are you going in person? Are you going online? What are you doing in this festival? And this sort of open thinking, creatively thinking around festival has also been very producive and conducive of thinking, you know, what are the barriers of festival development in different ways? And uh, so this is something that we're still working on and analyzing very much uh, in work in progress. So just a concluding slide, um, very much uh, uh, thinking that uh, this uh, work and the data we collected look at the importance of, of festival more in an ecological perspective. So very much thinking about the creative ecology of South Africa and now festival and as in, in many ways, be able to take some leadership and some ownership on the development of the creative economy, not simply thinking about themselves, but also thinking about the broader uh, collective cultural uh, community. Um, we think that potentially they might play a strategic position, have a strategic position in the future in terms of funding, investment, if policy, you know, was to look at organizations that could enhance create connectiveness, could enhance digital services for artists, could enhance some of these aspects 
festival would be a good port of call for that investment, for that sort of a focus to be put on. And uh, in a sort of way, I, I, I mean, I really, I thought about this yesterday, but it told me it was really interesting to think also way festival and potential to change because of COVID-19 and actually take new directions and not being just those temporary events, those small organizations that come together just in time to deliver something, but become more central to the local and national creative economies and take more leadership in this, uh, you know, working with artists, supporting artists and working with local policymakers to, you know, establish uh, those more solid grounds for development. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you so much, um, Roberta. I mean, since I'm part of the team, I can't say, you know, brilliant research, but it was, it was very good, thank you. And um, I'm very happy that we're recording the, the session actually, because um, it's, uh, it, it's, you really kind of encapsulated this big diverse project um, in, in one very nice um, meaning making package, if I can put it that way. So thank you very much. Um, there is some chat going on in the chat box, so um, if you're thinking of questions or, or comments or there are things you'd like to add, um, please go ahead and we'll return to those um, for a few minutes at the end. Um, I'd now like to hand over to uh, my colleague, Dylan Tarantal, who's going to be talking a little bit more about the kind of Google Analytics and big data aspect of doing festival research. Over to you, Dylan. I uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you, Roberta, for the introduction to the Future Festival uh, South Africa study. Um, as Jen said, and Roberta said, I am part of the Future Festival South Africa team. Um, and today we will look at Seems we have lost Dylan, right? I think we might have lost Jen. Too. Both, both, yes. Yeah, I think it might be something to do with the South African yes. um, the power cuts and stuff like that. I think they mentioned this in other. Do we want to do, take some question maybe for Ear or myself while we wait them for them to come on again? Ah, Jen is here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let's see. Maybe a short question uh, for uh, you, Roberta, and maybe also Ian. Uh, do you expect also some consequences uh, of COVID on the festival in longer term? aspect also after the pandemic and so on maybe ian do you want to go first yeah um I, I cut out a little bit on the on the question there but um i think um in terms of long-term impact uh yeah i mean what we've seen here in in denmark at least is that there has been a whole series of smaller events that have popped up in the last year and so organizers and entrepreneurs have taken the opportunity to promote smaller smaller events and uh, boutique events and small scale stuff. Uh, they haven't gone digital, but they've played with the Corona rules. Let's say up to 5,000 people can attend an open air event. And they've gone about clever ways of designing the festival space so that it becomes more Corona wise and Corona safe. Um, the big the big events already have their tickets sold out for the next year for the next year so they're they're already guaranteed and they're already announcing big lineups and stuff like this so the major events in denmark relatively unaffected 
but but I think uh, general, uh, what um, Roberta says is also true in the Danish case, is that this has also been a period of questioning for festivals. We've found that in our data as well. And so festivals also have to demonstrate a certain type of consciousness in relation to COVID and the reflexivities around it. And this is something that they're doing. Roskilde Festival, a massive music festival here, has generated a second festival, um, which somehow is more of a socially conscious type of event. Um, not just music, but art and so on. So, so I think these are a couple of the changes that, that have been observed. Yeah, yeah I feel um, for South Africa as well, uh, you know, we see that uh, there are um, short term impacts change that an adoption that we are happening in the short term, but I think all of the festivals see now themselves as having changed for good. So whether they will continue obviously to do face-to-face -face in events whenever that is an option, they will certainly be doing that. But I think the kind of online activities, the kind of other form of engagement and work they've done will not be just left, you know, to somebody else, will not just be forgotten. I think it will be something that whether slowly or fast, depending on funding or investment, they will definitely keep on uh, taking forward and developing part. And, and it's, as I mentioned, uh, probably the issue will be about thinking more carefully about business models. So for a lot of this festival, you know, this year, they hardly broke even, you know, they, they obviously did all they could with the funding they had, but it didn't really manage to make any money or, you know, some of them lost money if they had sponsor other thing. So for them, it's very much now the point we're saying we've tried and tested some things, they work, but how can we make them sustainable so that in the long term, they can pay for itself, they can keep on growing because otherwise, obviously, that would not be possible to be or sustainable in the long term. Thanks a lot. I think now we have Darren, Del, Dylan. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, apologies. We we both, Dylan and I, seem to have just had a complete internet blackout there. Um, but thank you very much, Andrea, for stepping in. Um, can Dylan carry on for a bit, um, Andrea? Great. Thanks. Yeah, Go for I, it, Dylan. Uh, um, oh, I just need permission again to share. Sorry, sorry about that. There you go. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Um, that uh, tends to happen once you or if you spend hours and hours online scraping data, and then you end up um, using your quota. <laughs> so sorry about that. So um, anyway, as I was saying, with um, we were fortunate enough to receive permission or access to the Google Analytics data from the National Arts Festival. Um, who in 2020 um, held the festival online for the first time in response to COVID. And then in 2021, tried a hybrid attempt or a hybrid model um, to then um, share the festival with the rest of the world. Um, so essentially what Google Analytics is, is that it is a web traffic analysis application that provides real time statistics and analysis. Um, so these real time statistics and analyses are then used to assist with pattern discovery and trends in user engagement, which then form part of a report, which is then used as um, consumer behavior analytics, which provides further insights um, to help sustain um, traffic to um, traffic towards the web-based content and even improve the traffic towards these uh, web-based uh, contents. Um, now, the way uh, Google Analytics works is you have to create a Google Analytics account you then need to um, add a snippet of code to each page that you want to monitor traffic to. And then um, based on whether or not the participants accept the, the cookies, which then store the data, the, the, um, the code or the tracking code in your system software or the, the web pages will then record all the interactions of the users uh, within the scope of the website, as well as the initial step towards the website. Um, I'll explain that shortly. Um, so in terms of the, the way it collects it, it collects data in two forms, um, you know, Google Analytics. So these two forms are known as dimensions and metrics. Now, the first one, dimensions, is uh, qualitative attributes or labels, um, which are used to describe and organize data. 
And then in terms of the metrics, these are quantitative measures um, of a single data type or a type of data. Um, and these are used to then compare measurements across different dimensions. So essentially what that means is that dimensions comprise of metrics. Now in terms of some of the important metrics that you wanna capture by Google Analytics, um, the first one is essentially, obviously your users are the, the, the unique or new uh, visitors to your website. Uh, so you wanna keep track of that. And then a additional one is known as the bounce rate, which is a percentage of visitors who view only single page um, content. So um, uh, your bounce rate um, can either be high or low, um, depending on what type of website you're running. So you, if you have a single page website, then you would expect a high bounce rate. So 100% um, bounce rate. So they would just view the page and then close it. But then if you have a website with multiple pages, you would want to have a lower bounce rate unless um, you are directing your, your visitors or the users to a page where you want them to view the content and then just exit. So in that case, you'd also want a high bounce rate. And then a session is a group of visitor interactions that happen within a 30 minute window of activity. And then obviously your page views is then the total number of pages viewed within either specific session or uh, within a specific or by a group of people within a specific session. Um, so then these uh, metrics and dimensions are then uh, presented in three different categories. So these three different categories are, uh, are three different reports. So the first report is your acquisition report. The second report is your behavior report. And the final report is your audience report. So your acquisition report um, determines or indicates how visitors are getting to the site. Your behavior report is then indi uh, indicates what your visitors are doing on the site. And then your audience uh, report is basically a description of who your audience is, their demographics, age, location, language preferences, and so forth. Um, so this graphic um, is a representation of how Google Analytics works. So, um, the, the image is basically um, an indication of the digitization of your festival from a face-to-face -face, uh, realm to an online medium, where you have the domain of your website, which is indicated by the scope of the, the, um, the graphic. And then the white side on the right will indicate where your users are coming from. So these um, avenues or Part of your acquisitions uh, channels can include uh, Google searches, organic searches, can be via email, via social media, and then um, either by direct link, so typing in the actual URL of your website, or from referrals, so uh, other websites or other applications. So for instance, you would have your users, so for instance, this user is coming from an organic search, uh, second user is coming from an email-based link, um, you have your your young, your young users coming from social media, and then you have your referrals and the direct link. And then what the acquisition process then records is it records where these uh, users are coming from and then where or how they enter your site. So for instance, um, we have the e-commerce section. So essentially where people would purchase tickets, you have your multiple shows, and then you maybe have online stores that your, your users would want to interact with immediately upon entering your website. As I said, the acquisition phase or the acquisition report uh, then looks at how visitors arrive at your website. So the first one was direct links. So where you type in the actual URL of the landing page or the specific uh, site that you want to find. You have your organic or your paid searches. Um, so that's either Google or any other paid search um, platform. You then have email, social media, and then referrals. So via other applications, uh, websites, so forth. And then this information then gets collected and provides you information on where you as the festival organizer can then find your target audience. So either direct links or via social media, et cetera. Now the issue with um, the data for the acquisition report is that um, you might have dark traffic. So by dark traffic, we refer to traffic that is incorrectly labeled as direct traffic by Google Analytics. So this could be traffic either via chat apps, so either via WhatsApp. Um, so for instance, if my body, my space had a link in their uh, platform 
to the National Arts Festival, then that would be uh, rendered as direct um, link, but actually would be a referral. And then from email clients such as Outlook and Gmail, so that would also be referred to as direct traffic, but instead it should be referred to as email, captured as email. And then finally dark searches, which are searches within other apps. So then that would either be organic search or a referral. So then in terms of the acquisition data that is then collected by Google Analytics, you can derive a pie chart as follows. So for instance, um, we had the we had access to the Google Analytics for the virtual arts or for the National Arts Festival for 2020 and for 2021. So in terms of the acquisition channels, 43% um, um, of the traffic towards the website was generated via direct links. But as we said earlier, that could include dark traffic as well. And then a third of the, the, the traffic um, traffic uh, towards the site came from other social media platforms. Um, in terms of 2021, it's a similar scenario whereby we have 34% coming from direct, um, so direct entry of the URL or directly entering the, the website, or and then a 33%, and then a 33% or a third then coming from social media. And then in terms of the comparison, we can just see that um, the acquisition channel um, has then decreased from 2020 to 2021 in terms of the direct um, traffic, uh, so entering the website directly. And that's because in 2021, BNAF um, or the National Arts Festival employed a paid search uh, mechanism of getting more people onto the site. Um, so I'm just quickly going to go over the bounce rates um, because we don't have a lot of time left. So essentially just um, any indication of how bounce rates differ across your different channels. Uh, but then this could be that the virtual arts festival had direct links on all these other platforms, which took the users to the direct sites that they wanted to watch or the actual content they wanted to watch and then just leave the website afterwards. And um, an indication of the average time spent on these pages and seconds is quite similar to the previous year. So it's um, not that they didn't want to participate in the arts festival, but rather had direct means of getting to their content. And then in terms of the, the behavior and the acquisition, I mean the behavior and the audience uh, reports, the behavior just merely monitors how people interact with different aspects of the website and then records the time and date this happens and then also um, who the audience members are. So their age, and then specifically just the gender. So as I said, how behaviors behave on the website, how they are engaging with the site, uh, provides a complete picture of the journey. So usually, um, so from where the, the consumer enters the website to where they exit and how many um, iterations it takes for them to exit the website. And then we'll also indicate the popularity of a particular part of the site according to time of day or day of the week. So as you can see in 2020, um, the demand that was initially lower, but that's because of the model that uh, the National Arts Festival used and then slightly started to increase until the end of the actual date of the festival and then steadily decreased afterwards. Um, for 2021, it was more or less the same at the beginning and then towards the, uh, after the end of the festival, then slightly started to decrease. And then in terms of popularity, according to day of the week, um, the festival for both 2020 and 2021 had their most viewers on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then finally, the last aspect, the audience. So identify the type of visitors that visit the website. So the report provides high levels of insights into demographics of audience. So for the, for the National Arts Festival, we, are, we unfortunately do not have the age and gender statistics, um, because we only started tracking from the 13th of August, which is beyond the scope of the studies for the 2020 and 2021 festival. Um, also, we didn't uh, track the interest of the audience up until that date. We can, however, get the geographical location, can track whether we have new or returning users, and then we can also track which devices they use to access. So uh, the comparison of 2021 and 20. Uh, 2020 and 2021 um, daily users increased initially and started decreasing after the end of the the actual festival uh, but the content was still available afterwards 
And as you can see, there's a high correlation between new users and the total number of users, indicating that um, our old returning visitors were more or less constant over the, the, the entire festival. And a similar pattern can be experienced for the 2021 uh, data. And then in terms of user location, 80% of the audience came from South Africa in 2020, and then that decreased to 75% in 2021. And then in terms of the spread across South Africa, 50% um, of our audience members were located in Cape Town and Johannesburg in both 2020 and 2021. Okay, thanks. Hopefully that was in time, Jen. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, um, <laughs> Dylan. Um, that was like the, the speed version. Yeah, sorry um, about I, <laughs> um, I have to say that um, uh, when we share these results with the festival, they, they are, are kind of amazed because all of this has implications for things like how long your festival should be, which times you should target for live streaming, um, whether you should invest in um, translation services, depending on where people are coming from, um, what sort of marketing channels you should use. Um, and so, so it's, um, it's data that, that they've never had before because we haven't been able to have the kind of access um, to what people are doing online um, in this kind of detail or how they're interacting with festival content. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, okay, I know we're a little bit beyond time, three minutes past five where I am, um, but I just want to... Um, uh, see if they kind Seems we have problems again. <laughs> Maybe if there is a question in the audience in between to uh, Professor Woodward and to Professor Communion. Please. Maybe I will have just one question, but please also others. It, oh, Jen is here. Great. So we can continue. Excellent. Sorry, my apologies. Um, Great. It's very windy yeah. where we are. And it's, um, okay. Um, so there was a question from, from John. That was as far as I got. Um, do, you want to, do you want to pose the question, John, or it's, it's not, no longer available in my chat? I would, uh, I think I addressed that in the chat, or at least I tried to, they're good questions. Um, and, and I guess I would emphasize the complexity of the, of the, um, of the festival scape in Denmark, but also in Europe, um, but, but also the, the complexity of the government response and how much governments were willing to prop up festivals in 2020 and even in 2021 uh, to ensure that they, they survived. And in Denmark, at least um, this happened to uh, a, a high degree John also asked about um, about um, innova innovation as an argument for state support of festivals, and yeah, I think here, at least in Denmark, questions of tourism, questions of um, longevity, questions of con perceived contribution to, to Danish communities matters, but there are also many smaller events that receive uh, government or communa support at, um, at this from the state. Great. Thank you. Again, yeah, yeah. He, he had replied to them in writing, so we're all here. Great, thank you. I'm glad you, you're covered. Um, I, I must say that uh, I, I actually did have a question, if I may, um, for, for you, Ian, as well. Um, and that was when you were talking about um, the, the social interaction and, and belonging a role of festivals. So, so that very important kind of experience which goes beyond just music. Um, did you, for, for festivals that moved online, um, were there perhaps um, 
some ways that you found that audiences tried to overcome the the fact that they were really maybe watching by themselves um, on their own? Like, was there was there in in your tracking of what they did? So you showed us their, um, you know, the yes. kind of in person ways. Yeah, but were there? Yeah. But you? yeah, you're right. Like, uh, but I, I guess I'm not. I'm not. I guess I can't speak to that part of the study in particular, but I know that um, some of the researchers in the group uh, or in, in the study are, are looking at these sort of things. And online participation um, is not seen by audiences as a, a sustainable way of them relating to festivals in the long term, um, that it's something that, 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 that they perceive as somewhat valuable for the moment but not something that would hook them in. So um, festivals, festivals, at least in Denmark, or, and, and I guess in the other European countries also see this, it doesn't make them much money or any money. Um, so in terms of the financial viability of running these digital events, it, the festivals invested, uh, but there was no expectation of making these commercial, making these necessarily commercial investments. Um, but they're two separate questions, but yeah, we, we, we also we also look at this dimension. I can't give you a systematic answer at the moment uh, because other researchers, mostly the younger scholars in the group, are looking at these questions. Jen might have gone anyway. I think she went, but she might be back. If anybody has any question, please also feel free to unmute and ask. I would have one small question. It would, it would, it would be for Dylan, but I don't know if he's here. So I ask all the speakers, um, is it possible to access how much of the visitor, in particular, to the online clicks and so on, um, one would expect that due to COVID, the people were much more at home and clicked probably much more also due to COVID and not only due to festival interest. How much of this is related to COVID, to staying at home, and how much to the attractiveness of the festivals? I think it's really interesting to know, maybe Dylan so and others thanks oh hey andre um, yeah sorry about that um the internet seems to be very uh, turbulent here in Grimson at the moment um in terms of whether the, the your question is is the success rate of the festivals de dependent on COVID or people staying at home but you showed the numbers of the clicks and yeah, yeah just the thinking, is there any method have you thought how to separate the effect of staying at home due to COVID and clicking due to these reasons and attractiveness of the websites attract so the festival reasons. Um, so for from Google Analytics or the digitization of the data, you can't do that because there's no way of evaluating that behavior. But what we do do is that we don't only look at the digital data, but we also run questionnaires where we ask the, the audience members what type of festivals they prefer. So do they prefer the online? Do they prefer a hybrid? Or do they prefer the normal face-to-face? -face? Now, from the initial findings of those, um, those results, um, it's, there's an indication that people prefer um, the more face-to-face -face or the, the pre-COVID festivals compared to the online festivals. So it seems that it might be the attractiveness of the website, but from those results, it's more of an indication that um, it's because people are at home and in COVID and they can't actually attend these festivals. So now they, as a means of getting some sort of entertainment or having some sort of utility from um, an online medium, they then settle for these online festivals. Yes, that's but, but perhaps I could just add on to that is that some festivals, that is true, um, it, it wasn't the first best option for most people, but some festivals grew their audiences massively um, through the um, through their their hybrid interactions. So, um, for example, my body, my space one. Uh,
Jim, are you with us? Oh, I thought I disconnected. <laughs> Maybe also. Yeah, no. please, please yeah what, what, Jen, what Jen was saying about my body, my space is that they indeed had, had better reach now because um, they are now on WhatsApp and they targeted um, the low tech um, audience members. So they had a, so, so they had a wider reach opposed to where they would have their my body, my space, um, basically in one particular location, which then minimizes the reach of the more poor, um, I, I suppose, or the, the, the less privileged audience members of reaching the festival. So I think that's what she was trying to say. So yeah, yeah, indeed. So at, from that aspect, yeah, you can say that some of these uh, festivals with their online presence has improved um, their, their reach. Yeah, this is also the case uh, that we've found here in, in the Danish study, for example, that festivals perceive that they have somehow expanded uh, or reached a slightly different audience because of what's happened in the last year or two. Um, whether, this, whether this is an audience that comes to the physical, um, comes to the physical event when it resumes they're not sure but but same similar pattern great is there any further question to any of the speaker jen is really i think born today with the internet she's sent me a message oh she's back hi um, well, thank you. I'm temporarily here, but it, it really seems to come and go. I'm quite cheesed off. We've just upgraded to fiber. So this is supposed to be, you know, 5G excitement. But anyway, um, I just wanted to quickly say thank you very much to our three speakers. Um, I think we got a really interesting kind of combination of, of um, different kinds of studies. And, and what struck me especially was the similarity of some of the findings in these kind of very, very different contexts. So um, I think that um, it's going to be really exciting once we start kind of publishing and sharing these results more. And I hope that we can stay in contact. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And apologies again for my technical difficulties. Thank Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank likewise, you. Jen. Yeah, it's interesting to see the findings for sure. This mirrors um, mirrors some of the stuff that we're we're finding as well. So it's really interesting for us. Did um, so. You have a website. Do you have um, in, um, Twitter or something like this for the project? We did um, because it's such a short term project. It's on its short term. Yeah, okay. yeah, it okay. doesn't make sense. Good. To... Good. We're, there's a one of the European projects in the funding program we're in is having a conference in Dublin, I think, in March, and uh, around these sorts of questions they call Fest Space, and we'll have a conference in Copenhagen in a, in maybe this time next year october november so um again around festival festivals and so on so um keep a look out for those but but yeah i think uh the, 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 it's very interesting great thank you thank you very much for those ideas it would be marvelous to to meet in person which is kind of what we hope the the kiosk seminars would do right is to expand our our research networks and provide new platforms for um, collaboration. So thank you very much. Um, yeah. We really appreciate you, no the problem. time that um, you took to, to join us. Pleasure to, uh, pleasure to be involved in, and to participate. I just want to add that the webinar is recorded. So probably uh, this night or tomorrow, it will be already on the uh, CS YouTube channel. Great, okay. thank, you. Sure. thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye